My name is John Blades. I'm the director of the Flagler Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here on behalf of the trustees and staff of the museum. Um, and I want to also welcome the online audience. Um, this is, these uh, lectures are live streamed, so in case you can't join us in person, feel free to go to the museum's website, click on a link there that allows you to see the lecture live streamed, as well as see archived lectures as well. So if you missed a lecture, you can go back and see it, or if you want to see it again, you can see it. I want to thank our sponsors uh, related, Southeast, First Republic Bank, and the Smith Architectural Group for making this lecture series possible. We're in the fifth of seven lectures on the architects of America's Gilded Age. I want to remind everybody to silence your cell phones, please. Make sure that they're turned off. Let's not take a chance on an Amber Alert or something like that interrupting the lecture. Um, if you happen to have wandered in here with an audio tour one, please hold it up so that the staff can collect those. They have a built-in uh, alarm system that sometimes uh, is set off by the AV system in this room. We have books for you to sign uh, after the lecture, we are for you to buy if you like and can be signed after the lecture. We've also got books from previous lectures that are signed by the author in case you missed one of those lectures and you'd like to get one of those books, we have those available as well. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Richard Guy Wilson. He's Professor Emeritus in Architectural History at the University of Virginia, where he taught for almost a half a century. He should have hung in there another year. It would have been half a century. In addition to being a professor of architectural history, Dr. Wilson has thus far enjoyed a very prolific career that includes giving 15 to 20 guest talks around the U.S. and abroad every year. That now totals more than 600 talks he's given, or lectures, worldwide. He serves on numerous boards, including the Virginia State Board, the Preservation Society of Newport County, Monticello, Preservation Piedmont, and many others. He's been featured in about 75 television programs as an expert on architectural history. He's authored or co-authored at least 13 books, edited and contributed to five other books, curated or co-curated 11 exhibitions, published over well over 100 articles, and more than 130 introductions and short essays. So, whew, having said all that, we are delighted to have Dr. Richard Guy Wilson join us for our Whitehall Lecture Series. Please join me in welcoming him. Good. Well, thank you very much. I am delighted to be here and in this wonderful building, which unfortunately isn't by Charles McKim, uh, but it does show some of McKim. I'll come back to this later on. That. Uh, uh, his finger was dabbling up in New York, probably when this thing was being, uh, 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 when this was being designed. So uh, with that, um, the architecture, what I am going to try to do in a short period of time is to cover, and I'm not gonna cover every damn building uh, because the official list of the number of buildings built during McKim's tendency in the firm of Kim Mead and White is over 900. So anyway, uh, don't worry, you're not gonna get all of them, but I'm gonna try to show you some of them. And, but the point is, is that his architecture is rather varied. And it can go from, on the right, what we sometimes call now shingle style, but uh, that is not the term that he knew then. It was known as modernized colonial. Uh, but the houses that are covered in shingles. And then, uh, and as you can see, it's not too many years later, uh, the Boston Public Library, which I'll be coming back to. Is this okay? Um, the Boston Public Library, which I'll be coming back to, which is rather something uh, rather, uh, rather different. Uh, these two buildings right here no longer exist, but arguably they are two of the most important buildings that McKim was involved in in his career. The one on the left, which as you can see, was in Newport, Rhode Island, the Taylor House, is arguably the first, quote, Georgian revival building in this country and really sets in motion, helps to set in motion the so-called colonial revival uh, and this, uh, this type of architecture. 
And then on the right, um, you can tell by the automobiles, as this photograph was taken a number of different years ago there. Uh, this is the old Pennsylvania Railroad Station in New York City, which also doesn't exist. As I say, both of these are gone. Uh, the Taylor House burned down, gosh, about 100 years ago. Uh, and uh, Penn Station, well, as is said, you used to enter New York as a conquering Roman hero, and now you enter as a rat. <laughs> but if any of you have been in, the present Penn Station has zero to, uh, as, uh, has, uh, has zero to do with him. Uh, it is, though, I think worthwhile to note, just as sort of a footnote, that the destruction of this building in 1963 helped to set in motion uh, the National Historic Preservation Act, which was passed in 1966, uh, and that there was quite an outcry over the destruction of this, and this, this is the only reason, but this is one of the main reasons why, uh, uh, under uh, Lyndon Johnson's term, uh, the National Historic Preservation Act uh, was done. Uh, his architecture, as I've been saying, is rather varied, and I'll be coming back uh, to this a little bit later on, and then you have a lecture, I think, next week. Uh, which covers some of this on the left. But he was very, very involved in the uh, World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, uh, and then in the redoing of Washington, D.C. in the mall, which I again will come back to, uh, was a very big, uh, was, a, was, a, was a very big event uh, in, in, uh, uh, in his work. Sorry. Am I too loud? Um, okay, so anyway, um, the architecture that McKim was known for, and today your lecture series here has been said to be the Gilded Age. Not that there's anything wrong with the Gilded Age, but actually what he was attempting to do in his architecture was to create the equivalent of that renaissance that happened there in Italy in the 15th and the 16th century, could that happen again here in this country? And I'm showing the covers of two books here. Uh, on the left, as you can see, it was published in 1904 with the title of the American Renaissance. And then on the right, this is a book I did, part of an exhibit that I did at the Brooklyn Museum and then traveled around the country uh, in 1979 uh, through 1981. Uh, and what it was all about, what this American Renaissance was all about, uh, was, and this is a quote by McKim. This is a quote of McKim about 1901, and he said, and I quote, in the past, dominant nations have always plundered works of art from their predecessors. America is taking its place among the nations and has therefore the right to obtain art wherever it will. In other words, to pick up this stuff that is over there. And to just sort of point this out, the term Renaissance, which I'm sure when I use with all of you today, you do think about it, what, back there in Italy, and you know, those guys floating around building cathedrals, painting ceilings, doing all of this sort of stuff. Uh, that was not defined until the mid 19th century. And it was initially some German historians who came up with the term Renaissance and then it floated over into France, and then across the channel to England, and then across the big pond to this country. But in other words, the Renaissance was basically a new sort of an idea. And what they were talking about was that, for instance, this is a book that was published by a Bernard Berenson. Some of you who maybe took art history courses a thousand years ago, remember having to struggle through some of Bernard Berenson's works and so forth. But Bernard Berenson and his uh, Venetian painters of the Renaissance, he was born in Boston, though get out of Boston, go over to Europe. Uh, uh, but in his Venetian painters of the Renaissance, published in 1894, uh, he said, and I quote, we ourselves, because of our faith in science and power of work, are instinctively and simply of the Renaissance. The spirit which animates us was anticipated in the spirit of the Renaissance. And, and we, that was the small rough model after which ours is being formed. And so what was going on, and there were hundreds of articles that were published that were in Scribner's Magazine, Century Magazine, you name it at that point in time, about the Renaissance and the way that this might be a model 
might be a model for uh, might might be a model uh, might be a model for us over here. So with that, oh, uh, well, here, excuse me, I forgot. This is a page out of the House American Renaissance. Uh, and as you can see, what you have over there, if you look on the left, I hope you can read that, right? Simplicity, the one on the bottom, my God, get rid of that crap and so forth, you know. Uh, and then, of course, here on the right, in other words, this very carefully composed architecture. This is what we're talking about. They're getting rid of all of the high Victorian extravaganza and so forth uh, and creating great works. Okay, so going to the firm of McKim, Mead, and White and to uh, talk about them, it is, and let me just say, you've already had a talk here by Sam White a couple of weeks ago, and let me just say that Sam and I are friends, though he's on one side of the platform and I'm on the other side, uh, and it is rather common, unfortunately, uh, when you do go out different places, you all of a sudden see, this is a Stanford White, Stanford White, Stanford White. And I've been with Sam and he shook his head and looked over me, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, because the work was, the work of the firm was multi, and that there were the different partners, there were the, the, there were the different partners that were very, much, very, very much, uh, very much involved in it. But what I do think is important to notice with this is that also the name of the firm, whose name is first, Who's sitting in the center? Who's sitting to the left? Mead. Who's sitting to the right? The most famous one, uh, Stanford White. Uh, but as I'm trying to say, that the, this, this is a, com a, a complicated story. And Stanford White, uh, there are endless numbers of books and so forth been written on him and all this. And he was a very colorful individual. He knew how to wear clothes that really showed off his red hair. And of course, the way he left this life, being shot on the roof garden of Madison Square Garden, a building that he had designed uh, by Harry K. Thaw. Uh, and that always helps out with the reputation to go out like that. But, uh, and Stanford White did design a tremendous number of these buildings, but his real strength was in decoration. He was more the decorative part of the firm. Uh, and not to say that he doesn't do other works, but that he, that, that, that his work, his, uh, uh, that, uh, that his, his work uh, is like that. And I should have noted that uh, the, the office nicknames of the partners, McKim in the center, his office nickname was Ramonte. Mead on the right was known as Dummy. And Stanford White was known as Cellini. Uh, Cellini was the Renaissance decorative artist. Ramonte was, and of course, Dummy. Well, he's the guy that actually ran, uh, ran all the work. And that comes to William Rutherford Mead. He's the guy that's so frequently ignored. I'm showing you here on the right, he did have a, a brother who was a very well-known sculptor at the time, uh, who is unfortunately has been somewhat forgotten. Uh, but Mead uh, uh, is from Brattleboro, Vermont. Uh, went to Harvard University, then went abroad, never to study architecture, but he did study engineering, and comes back to this country in the mid-1870s, hooks up with McKim, and they ultimately become partners and remain, par remain partners, uh, remain partners uh, uh, for the rest of the time. Um, I should note, and this is just sort of a little footnote, but to show you how these things go, that Mead's sister, Eleanor Mead married William Dean Howells. And any of you that are literary freakos will know that William Dean Howells is one of the major literary figures of the later 19th century in this country. He was the editor of Century Magazine for a number of years, wrote a bunch of different novels and novels and all of this. And that one of the very earliest works that McKim did with Mead and another partner, not Stanford White, but William Bigelow, was this house, which still is there uh, in Belmont, Massachusetts. It should be covered in shingles. It is not any longer. But this is. But the point that I'm making here is that they had connections into the intellectual life, into the literary life, and so forth of the people at the time, and that this is uh, and that this is uh, is very important. Okay, Charles Fallen McKim. That's him on the far left. 
he was named after this man right here, Charles Fallon, who was an ardent abolitionist. And he was fired from Harvard University being, for being too much of an abolitionist. McKim's parents that are right up here were also ardent abolitionists. And this down here is Box Brown, an escaped slave from the South who was shipped north in a box to them in Pennsylvania and where it was opened up. In other words, he comes from a family of very much a revolutionary type of individuals. Now, how much this fits over into this architecture? Well, that's another question. But what I do think it is that is important is that there is a certain sort of reform element that is with McKim, and that he really wanted that he really that he really wanted to re uh, re really wanted to reform reform architecture. Okay, so a little bit about me, uh, a little bit about Charles Fallon McKim. Uh, uh, as they say, his, his parents were ardent abolitionists. Uh, he was born uh, down in Pennsylvania, but they had moved up to Boston. Uh, and uh, he went to Harvard. He was apparently very good at baseball at Harvard, but he only lasted about two years. And he left Harvard to go off to Europe to study at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in, in Paris. Now, I'm showing you the left. This is a portrait relief of, of, of McKim by Augustus St. Gaudens, who is one of the great sculptors of the time, and we'll be coming back to St. Gaudens. But once again, this connection, and this is a, a, a portrait relief of, of McKim about 1878, before it really has any sort of a reputation and so forth, is already very, very heavily connected into the artistic community. Well, what McKim does is he goes off to Paris to study at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. And the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, I'm sure you all know, we use the term Beaux-Arts architecture today and all this sort of stuff. But it was a school in Paris for sculptors, for painters, for decorative artists, and for architects. And McKim is, and it's a little unclear, he's either number five or number six of the Americans that went there to study architecture. And he went to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and lasted a couple of years. This is a big complex that is on the left bank in Paris. I'm just showing you one building here. Uh, but what you did there was you learned architecture through going through studios and then having a lecture or two on the outside. And any of you that are familiar with the way architecture is taught today or the way that a lot of the arts are taught today is the studio, is the basis. And then you have the blabblers like me that are outside that are giving the, that are, the, uh, the, the, that are giving the information. Anyway, he comes back from Paris and he goes to work for the architect who was the second student, had been at the Cola of Beaux-Arts, Henry Hobson Richardson. And he worked for Richardson. Richardson had an office in New York at that point in time. We always think of him as a Boston architect, but he was actually a, had an office in New York. But he'd just gotten this big commission for a Trinity Church uh, up in Boston, and McKim works on this. And this is one of the great, and I'll come back to this in half a minute, because McKim's most important building is built right across the street from it. But he works on this. And he works on other things with, uh, 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 with Richardson. Richardson had some jobs down in Newport, Rhode Island. And Newport, Rhode Island was becoming really the spot to go and get away during the summer months and so forth. Uh, and these are two of Richardson's houses that were there. And McKim worked on these. The Andrews house on the left, uh, well, it had been finished, but then McKim comes in and does some things. The Watt Sherman house, uh, the Andrews house no longer exists. The one on the right does exist. Uh, but McKim, and of course, this is what architects always do. They steal the clients of their employers. Uh, and so what he did was he stole Sherman when he steps off on his own and does remodeling. And so this is the interior. You can get into it today. It's owned by Salvary Regina University. Uh, but this is a room that this is a room that he did, and also they made some mod uh, they also made some mo modifications uh, 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 mo modifications uh, to the exterior. Now McKim is in Newport doing these works for Richardson, and then leaving, but he gets really enthralled. And one of the most interesting things that is not that well known is that he really sees all this old architecture of the late 17th, the 18th century. And Newport was one of the central ports of trading and so forth in the 18th century. And 
he commissions an arch uh, a photographer, John Appleby Williams, to go out and take pictures of old Newport buildings. And this is arguably the very first photographic record done of early American architecture. And so he does the old brick market, does the interior, uh, 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 does the interior of, of, of Trinity Church. Uh, they pull some furniture out onto the porch to take pictures of it. Take a picture of this so-called so -called Viking mill, supposedly. This is something that Leif Erikson built when he came over uh, in the 13th century. That is, excuse me, a bunch of Anyway, I won't give the term there. Uh, actually, it's a very late, it's an early 18th century old stone mill, uh, but it's still there, takes pictures of this. Uh, goes out, old windmill, the old trees that have been planted, uh, that have been planted, an old house, a, and in this portfolio, and I, over the years, have located about 10 copies of this portfolio in different collections and so forth. There is in a couple of them, instead of 30, 30 photographs, there's 31. And the 31st photograph, the odd photograph, is this photograph on the right. The one on the left is a house that was there. The one on the right is this photograph inserted in. What the heck is going on? Why was this photograph, why was this photograph put in? Now I should note that McKim did have the photograph on the left published in a new, one of the very earliest American magazines in architecture, the New York Sketchbook, the New York Sketchbook, Sketchbook of Architecture. But what it is that is going on here is that it's actually a remodeling that McKim had done of an early Newport house, inserted this damn fireplace into the thing, had a photograph taken of the thing, and then published it as a genuine old. That's architect for you. And that, that's, the, that's the interior there on the left, uh, uh, which I do get into, uh, every, uh, I, I, which I do get into uh, very frequently, uh, frequently every summer. Uh, the other thing, though, is, is interesting is, for instance, on the left, here's a photograph uh, that was taken. And on the right, this is a house they did a few years later. And you can see exactly what they're doing. They're picking up these motifs and so forth and putting them into their architecture. And this is where, excuse me, the so-called colonial revival or the Georgian revival later on, the sort of the variations in this sort of develops, is it really develops here, it's really, it's, it's, it's really developing here with McKim. Um, another photograph on the left, and it's puzzled me over the years. He published me, what the heck is he going to there? All of these different damn roofs and so forth. Now the thing in the very background with the, uh, with the oculus up there that you see, uh, that's actually the colony house. So he doesn't take a picture of the front of the colony house. Instead of all this conglomeration of buildings. Well, this is a little stable that he did in Newport at the time. And it's not the same thing, but you can see the way that he is sort of picking up on this, this sort of random types of motifs and, and doing that. Um, in 1878, the year before, 1877, McKim establishes a partnership in New York City with William Rutherford Meade and William Bigelow. Bigelow had also been in Paris with McKim, and McKim actually married Bigelow's sister. The marriage only lasted three years, and that's the reason why the partnership of McKim, Meade, and Bigelow goes up, and instead of that, Stanford White joins in. But he's in a partnership with, with, with Bigelow. And in 1878, McKim, Meade, Bigelow, and the young punk, Stanford White, did a tour up on the North Shore of Boston. I don't know exactly what they saw, but I would assume that they would have seen the Ward House, which is one of the earliest houses, colonial houses, that there is here in this country. And then look at this house on the right. I showed you this a little bit earlier. Of course, there's a porch across the front and so forth, but it's the same sort of reiterated gables you see that you have up there, that they're picking up on, uh, they're picking up on this. Now, the Isaac Bell House is one of their great, quote, shingle style. And I should have mentioned earlier, the term shingle style was invented by St. Vincent Scully, who taught for many years at Yale University and published a very important book. Uh, when he was once asked, 
why the term shingle stone? Because I liked it. <laughs> it is not the term that the boys would have used back then at all. Anyway, this is the, uh, the bell house, and keep that in mind. And then as we move around to the side of the bell house, see the tower? And look at the windmill that McKinnon had photographed. You can see a certain sort of a similarity there. And then if we move around to the rear of the house, look at that great slanting roof. And look at the slanting roof right here in this photograph that he had published in Old Newport, had taken in an Old Newport houses, this huge slanting type of a roof. So my point is, is that there is this way that architects are thinking in these years, especially McKim, is he's pulling different motifs and so forth, but what he's attempting to do or trying to do is to create, uh, is to create an American architecture. Uh, here's the plan of the Bell House, and it was a very unique sort of a plan uh, at that point in time. You can see that the porch is around there, uh, but that you can't come into the house from the side into this huge hall that stretches across there. This is a photograph that's in there. And then with this giant fireplace, it's a sort of a big colonial type of a fireplace, though the colonials would never have built a hall this big because just think about the span that's across there, the, uh, the upper floors on there. Uh, this shows the, the, uh, shows the differences. But what does happen is that McKim, Mead, and White are really the inventors of the so-called colonial revival. And from the shingled colonial, or modernized colonials as sometimes called, they graduate, and I showed this a little bit earlier, the, ta the Taylor House in Newport, which is no longer there. But what they're doing is they're looking back to the more G Georgian architecture, to the more symmetrical architecture, the more Renaissance architecture, rather than the random stuff of some of the earlier, some random stuff of, of, the, early, of the earlier colonial. Uh, and w what this does lead to is in the firm, as it gets established and get going, uh, that McKim is off in different directions. As I mentioned a minute ago, his marriage, uh, Mary, uh, uh, his marriage uh, to, to Mary Bigelow only lasted a couple of years, but he did marry again, Mrs. Julia Apple, Miss Julia Appleton, that is her, and they design, he designs his house for her up in, Len he designed the house for her in Lenox and then marries her, but unfortunately she passes away very soon thereafter. Uh, but what you see here, what I'm trying to point out is this divergence, that there's different things that are going on, and yes, they're beginning to pull it together, uh, and it really does sort of come together, I think we can say, with this building right here, which in any way you want to count it is one of the most important architectural landmarks in America, the Boston Public Library, located on Copley Square in Boston, McKim, and McKim is the lead architect on this, got the commission for this because the head of the library board of trustees was the uncle of his wife, Julia Appleton. And that's again, the way that architects always get their work, you know, is they steal it or it comes from other, it comes from other directions. So that's the VPL that you're looking at right there on the left. And this is a rendering of it uh, done right at the very beginning. This is not exactly the way the building would show up. Uh, for instance, notice here the triple arches, and it's only a single arch. But what is interesting, see, this is Richardson's Trinity Church that both McKim and White had worked on, and this is placed right across from it. And can you think of any two things more different? This huge tower. This is the old Museum of Fine Arts. Very picturesque. This is the new Old South Church that is located over here. And against all of this, this classical building that intrudes, that sort of in the, the, uh, 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 that comes in. Now, the BPL is based on a number of different sources. To some degree, it is based upon some Italian Renaissance palazzos. But it is also based on the building on the left, which was one of the landmarks and Paris, if you were an architect and you went to Paris to either go to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts or just to look around, you always went to the Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve. This was one of the great landmarks. And of course, it's a much longer building than McKim's building, as you can see here, but there is this very, very strong sort of a similarity to it. 
And what it points out is the way that what McKim is doing here is that he is now beginning to bring back a very different architecture to this country, a classical architecture, and it will come to, and, and, and it will co come to dominate. Uh, so here it is, uh, straight head on, as you can see. Uh, and it is a very functional sort of a building, and to some degree, he tells you exactly what it is. You don't need to hunt around to figure out how to get in. Uh, there's the damn entrances that are right there. Uh, and then you have the small windows on either side, which are offices and, and that sort of thing. And then the big, the big windows that are up across the top, of course, are the, uh, 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 of cor of course is, is, is the reading room. Uh, it was a big, big, big endeavor, uh, and uh, McKim devoted a great deal of his time, a great deal of his time to it. Uh, this is a very interesting photograph that is in one of the McKim Mead White archives at the Avery Library in New York of this photograph here on the left. And you can see this is wood scaffolding. And what it is, he's put up a imitation plaster of Paris cornice up there to check out what the shadow line details would be like before you actually erected, the, uh, ac you, you, uh, uh, you actually erected. And I should say that the material on this is a Milford granite, uh, which is uh, Milford is a little bit west, of, a little bit west of Boston, uh, and this is where all of the uh, where all uh, where all, all of the stone comes from. Uh, it was intended to be from the very beginning, the Athens of American art. That this is where you would see American art. Or you, this is where you would see Amer uh, you, uh, you, you, you would see American Amer American American art uh, 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 come together. Uh, and so he commissioned a variety of different people to do the work. Augustus Saint Gaudens, I mentioned before, was one of the great uh, was one of the great individuals at the time. Uh, he did the plaques right over the entrance. That's the plaque for the Boston Public Library. He was supposed to have done these statues here, but he never got his act together, and they're not done. Though if you ever go to his um, uh, summer place up in Cornish, New Hampshire, there's some models for them there, but Bella Pratt ultimately did these. And you have on one side, you have, the, uh, you have painting and sculpture. She's holding, you can see, a, uh, a, a painting board in her hand. And the other side is literature. And then right over the door down below, that head, that's by Daniel Chester French, who was one of the other great, or was one of the other great uh, sculptors of the time. Here's the plan, I already mentioned it before, but on the left, this is the, uh, on the left, this is the ground floor, this is where you come in, and of course it is a procession. Dum, dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum, and then finally the staircase, you have these offices and so forth that are here. Up the staircase, dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum, and then across the front, you have the big reading room. Where in the hell are the books? Well, okay, the books are back here, uh, stacked up and stacks, uh, stacked up and stacks on this side. Uh, but the point is that this was, and I mean, this is the Boston Public Library had been founded back in the 1850s. Uh, but this is really intended to be the great, uh, is really intended to be the, the great building. And then in the center, and I'm sorry I didn't, but I hope you you, you notice it here. Uh, you have this big open spot. It's the atrium uh, that's out here, uh, uh, or, or and uh, that you have uh, very much an Italian Renaissance type of a palazzo uh, that you can go out and if you want to uh, sit and, and uh, uh, sit and read. Um, as a little footnote to this. A number of the rooms in there have this type of vaulting, which was known as Guastavino vaulting. Raphael Guastavino had come over from Barcelona in Spain in 1881 to New York, and he brought along this system of high-fired interlocking clay tiles that could create great spans of space. And this is the first building it was done in. And it went on to become a very, 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 very popular thing up until the 19, late 1930s when concrete vaulting comes in and this goes out. But there is a very good book on Guastavinos. Uh, Guastavinos. Uh, you go up the staircase. The lions that are crouching there, they're by Louis St. Gaudens, Augustus St. Gaudens' younger and generally more inebriated uh, younger brother. Uh, and then you have this wonderful set of murals 
by Pierre Pouvet de Chave, who was the king of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. A lot of murals, he was it. He's forgotten today pretty much, but this is the person you want to study when you're over there. And McKim was able to convince him to do this set of murals, which is really the arts and the inspiration of the arts that leads you up the staircase, uh, uh, leads, you, uh, uh, leads you up the staircase. Uh, there are a couple of rooms on the, on, on the second floor or the main floor, you might say. Uh, and this is the book delivery room. This is where you put in your slip and your book would come back from the stacks and so forth. Uh, and you have this set of murals there by Edwin Austin Abbey, another great artist at the time. And it is the search for the Holy Grail. Or some people say a search for a book in the Boston Public Library. <laughs> but anyway, a wonderful set of murals. You can see that stretches, stretches around the room. And then this is Bates Hall, the big reading room that stretches across the front. That's a rendering by, there by McKim or by the office. Uh, and as you can see at the back of it, if you look carefully, you can see that there's something down there but ain't there. John Lafarge was supposed to put a mural in there. Well, Lafarge could never get his act together either, uh, and so there's never been a mural that's been put there. Uh, then there is up on the top floor, you ascend up, you ascend up, and do I have to explain who John Singer Sargent is to you? Well, he considered this to be his greatest work of art. Not his portraits and so forth, it was his hall of religions, and it's a cycle of all of the religions of the world. They're all in there. Of course, Christianity dominates at one end, but still it was this unity of trying to bring together, trying to bring together all, uh, bring together all the uh, cultures of the world. Um, I'm going to uh, wrap up here, hopefully, in just a couple of minutes. Uh, but just to note that McKim did do a lot of work. As I said, there is a tremendous amount of work that was done in the firm and that we've identified that he did. Uh, that he did. For instance, this house here, Beacon Rock in Newport, uh, a wonderful thing, did the interiors. And I bring this up because 1894, he gets a letter from Edith Jones Wharton, who had recently gotten married. She had not published any of her novels. She had done a couple of poems and a little short story. But he gets a letter from Edith Wharton and says, I am going to send you a manuscript. Would you look at it? And the manuscript that he sent, is sent is the manuscript for the decoration of houses, which is her first published book. It was published in 1897. And McKim's notes, sending back to her saying, do this, do that, and so forth, but it's a very good damn thing, is there. I'm bringing this up because this interaction is so important between the architects here and the larger literary cultural community and so forth that so forth that's going on. So that's Edith. Uh, uh, that's Edith about the time. Um, that's the type of hat she wore then. She's her, holding her two dogs in her hand, uh, as you can see there. Uh, but what it is, and of course, the decoration of houses, it's been republished I don't know how many different times. And you can get some argument on this, but it is really one of the most important books ever done on interior decoration, interior design in this country. Uh, and it's by Edith with Ogden Codman, Jr., though he actually didn't do a damn thing on it. Uh, and, but these are some of, the, uh, some, some of the illustrations, and it helps to set in motion uh, this sort of American Renaissance uh, uh, type of thing. Uh, there are many other buildings of McKim that I could uh, go into, and I just don't have time. There is up in Boston in the Back Bay. Uh, there, there are buildings such as on the right, uh, over in Harvard, he does the uh, he does Robinson Hall, which was the uh, which was the Harvard School of Architecture, but he also is very involved in sculptures and the sculptures that begin to dominate in many cases America uh, dominates Amer Amer American cities uh, in these years, and a number of these are done by, with St. Gaudens, uh, for instance, the Sherman Monument, uh, which is in the corner of 59th Street and Fifth Avenue in New York City, right at the entrance to Central Park. Uh, or on the right, uh, this is in Boston, this is the Shaw Memorial, 
uh, and uh, Mr. Shaw, in case you didn't know, or Colonel Shaw, led the 54th uh, Massachusetts Regiment of African American soldiers. Um, and here we are moving in on it. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this is, there he is uh, with, the, with the soldiers that behind him. But they did a whole bunch of these different sorts of, a uh, whole, whole bunch of these different things. Early February, 1891, McKim gets a letter. We're gonna have a meeting in Chicago about a world's fair. Could you come out to the meeting? So he goes out to the meeting, which was held on February 24th, 1891, and there they are meeting, and you'll be hearing about this, I think, in just uh, uh, next, uh, next week, but this is the office of Daniel Burnham. Uh, and seated around the table here. This is McKim right here that's showing off. This is Daniel Burnham over here, uh, the, the city right here. Uh, Augustus St. Gaudens is, is, is right here. I won't go through all the rest of the people. But what they were trying to figure out is, okay, we're gonna do this damn World's Fair. What should it be like? Well, what we can determine from the minutes of the meeting and so forth is that McKim says, look it. Let's do all the same color, white. Let's do it all in the classical idiom, a common 60-foot cornice line that will surround the court of honor. Uh, and that was, ultimately, that was ultimately what was built. Uh, and this right here, this is the McKim Mead and White building right here. Uh, no, excuse me, this is McKim Mead and White building over here. This is Daniel Chester French. Uh, the Statue of Republic here. Richard Morris Hunt did the administration building. This is Peabody and Stearns uh, that are over here. But this is, any way you want to look at it, one of the most important architectural events that ever occurred in this country. Uh, and there it is. And as I say, you'll be hearing more about it. This is the agriculture building that McKim Mead and White did. They were all temporary, with the one exception of one building, the Museum of Natural History. Everything else was temporary. It was only intended to stand. It was plaster of Paris, only intended to stand for a couple of years. But the idea was that maybe the spirit would catch on, that people would do this. For instance, and then different states did buildings. Uh, and this is the New York State Building, which is based upon the Palazzo Medici in Florence. On the right, this is the Massachusetts Building by the Boston firm of Peabody and Stearns. Uh, which is based on John Hancock House uh, uh, up in Beacon Hill. Um, the Virginia Building, guess which is the Virginia Building here. This is the first repo of that. Uh, and uh, I just put what Florida, what you had here in Florida. This is the building, uh, the, the Florida Building. Uh, another footnote, McKim Mead and White ran a big office. It is estimated that about at least 950 individuals worked in the office during the time that McKim was there. He passed away in 1909. And we have a list of a lot of these. This is an early office on the left, and I won't go through all of it, but here's the drafting room, here are some of the offices, reception room. Uh, this is where the drafting took, uh, drafting took place. But the office was more than just a drafting room. It was a training ground for architects. And so, and just to put in, that your boys here were employees of McKim, Mead, and White and went on to their own, uh, but that this is, this is where a lot of people got their start was in the office, uh, was in the office of McKim, Mead, and White. Uh, one last thing is that in 1901, Senator James McMillan of Michigan walked out of the Capitol and walked down the mall and was despondent. What has happened? The mall in Washington, D.C. that had been designed by Pierre Charles Lafont was the biggest mess in the absolute world. And this is a model right here that was made at the time. Here's the Capitol, this is the mall. Look at this. He said, can't we do some damn thing about this? And so what he did was he contacted a couple of architects, Daniel Burnham of Chicago and Charles McKim of Washington, uh, of, of, of New York. Uh, and the result of this was that they came up with a scheme for putting the mall back in and for extending the mall down to the river. 
uh, and putting in a, a couple of other monuments and so forth, as you can see here. Uh, the mall originally, originally just sort of stopped right here. The river came around like this, and this is all landfill and so forth. Uh, you did have the Washington Monument, uh, but this is all landfill down here and putting in monuments and so forth and, and, and so forth. And McKim is very, very, very much, the, uh, very much the leader on this. And as you can say, if you look over there carefully at the thing on the left, this is a cartoon, and that's McKim tooting the horn of all the boys walking down. And what's this up here? Teddy Roosevelt jumping up and down. My God, what the hell is happening here? And the result of this was that he was a friend of Roosevelt. He did remodel the White House under Roosevelt, added the, the East Room, kept the classical demeanor of the White House. And the Lincoln Memorial is not by him, but it's by a former office man, Henry Bacon, uh, and is very much, I would say, uh, his, uh, say very, very, very much uh, uh, his influence. So with that, I am going to stop, though to say that McKim received the Royal Institute of British Architects gold medal in 1903, and he's the second American architect to get that, and it was one of the highest honors that could be given anywhere in the world at the time. Four years earlier, he'd been admitted to the Legion of Honor in Paris, and that he was known really worldwide as a major, major, a major, major American uh, architect. Uh, and there's many other works that he did, whether you're talking about the library at Columbia University or the Rhode Island State Capitol. But the point is, is that he helped to change American architecture in a very, very dramatic way. Thank you very much. And if, I know some people fell asleep here, I could see it. Uh, but um, if anybody has any questions, I am delighted to try to uh, make up an answer to them. Yes. Okay, Sanford White kicked the bucket in 1906, or was shot in 1906. McKim died in 1909. Meade kept on with the firm, and the firm's name continued up into the 1940s. And there still is a very small successor firm that is in business in New York City today with a different name. But certainly their reputation and so forth kept on and there are plenty of government buildings and major buildings done in the late teens, the 1920s, that are, have the name McKim, Mead, and White on them. And so they, the firm kept on definitely uh, in all those years. And I say Mead was in there until, uh, I think he finally got out in 1917, 1918. Oh, I should note that uh, Sanford White's son, Lawrence Grant White, came into the firm and was in the firm up until the 1940s when he, when he passed away. Yes. Okay, the artisans, the people that did all this work. And no, I agree, I didn't put it in because that becomes a tremendous story in its own right. But there were a couple of different firms that they especially depended upon. And one of them was located initially in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, and went to be nationwide uh, and had the big quarries that were out there. And that, that's a firm that did a lot of their, did the Boston Public Library, went on and did other things. Uh, and uh, in the firm itself, I uh, say Meade is the center of the, the firm. He's the guy that controlled the damn contracts and made sure there is a, there is a story. I've never been able to find it. I've been intending on making my image of it, of a cartoon of Meade holding two, kites that are going in opposite directions. One labeled McKim, the other name White. Or as he once said, my job is to keep my partners from making damn fools of themselves. 
Uh, in other words, he's the fellow that controls all of this stuff. They are the designers and doing all this, but then you gotta get the damn stuff built. You gotta get the contractors in. And back in these days, you didn't have the general contractor like you have today. You had to bring in different people for different things. And it's very interesting, for instance, like in the Boston Public Library, don't quote me exactly on this, but and I've written about it somewhere, that there are at least 50 different names of different firms that were involved in the construction of the library. Because you just didn't have, the, you know, the general contractor comes in about 1916, 1917, uh, you know, and sort of pulls this stuff together. But in other words, you had to have somebody who controls all of this stuff and brings in and says, okay, I want you to do electricity, I want you to do the gas. Oh, stone, yeah, can you give me some stone, you know? And so it's a, it's a, it was a complicated, a complicated type of thing. Yes. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, McKim was very involved in that. The, the Columbia University used to be located down in Manhattan, uh, in the, in the, you know, the center of the city. Moved up there, and they bought. Don't quote me, but you know they bought about 50 acres of land or something up there, uh, and McKim was hired to do it. Uh, and the original layout, of course, it's changed uh, <laughs> too much over the years. Uh, but the center of it, of course, is the dome building uh, that's there, uh, and uh, it's the library. What American campus has a dome building at the center that's the library? UVA, University of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson's thing. And it's worthwhile to note that there was a big fire, I couldn't put all this in, a big fire at the University of Virginia in 1895, destroyed the rotunda, and who was hired to rebuild it? McKim, Mead, and White. They came down and rebuilt it, uh, and they helped to bring that. Uh, Jefferson had been sort of forgotten about as an architect, I mean, and all of this, and helps to bring him, elevate him back up to the position where he rightfully belongs, is one of the major ones. But no, the, the, the Columbia University campus with the library in the center, and originally it was to be a very symmetrical type of thing, uh, is, is basically McKim. Yes. Oh, sorry. Now, w w excuse me, the, what kind of a house was this in the 1950s? Oh, no, the last one in the library is down in the Well, yes, I mean, they were involved in a couple of other uh, smaller fairs and so forth because there came a World's Fair mania or a mania for I mean, out in San Diego, San Francisco, you name it, there was a damn World's Fair. Well, they weren't all World's Fair because you couldn't do a World's Fair one after the other in, in, in the same country. You had to have it, but there were a lot of these, yes. And so it was very, very influential, I would say. And I, I would argue the World's Columbian Exposition was one of the most influential architectural displays ever done in this country. And it is estimated that fully one third of the American public went to the World's Fair. And then in addition to that, uh, of course it was published, it was by that point in time you were, you were getting photographs and all of this sort of stuff. And so people knew about it. And so it really did, I think, make a major, major, uh, a, 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 a major impact. Yes.
Lord's lawyers. I'm sorry, did, I'm, Chicago Institute. Oh, Chicago Institute. No, he's not involved up there, though there's some similarities, but no, not involved up there that I know of. I mean, uh, there's a couple of us scholars, uh, Leland Roth and myself, or, but there's a number of others, uh, and we've gone through the damn papers so many times, and the bill books, they still exist and so forth, uh, except for the very, very earliest years, uh, and it, no, I don't recall anything on the Chicago. Yes. Can I ask you a little bit more personal question? What got you interested in architectural history in the first place? Do we have about an hour? <laughs> Short version. <laughs> um, in spite of what you've been hearing here, I'm a modernist. And um, I was born in Los Angeles, the home of everything new in a house designed by R.M. Schindler for my parents. And if you don't know Schindler, he was one of the great Southern California modernists along with Richard Neutra, and that's where I grew up. My parents were total architectural freaks and nuts, modern furniture and so forth. And every once in a while, I'd be out driving, we'd be out driving around, and I'd say, oh, look at that, that's nice. My mother would say, no, don't look at that. That's not what you should look at. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, but I, I mean, or, and I still do. I mean, my modern architecture, my house is modern. Uh, but I've discovered that there's a lot of other good stuff. Uh, and especially when you're teaching, you better like what it is that you're teaching. If you don't like what it is teaching, uh, you know, the message it gets across there is uh, so. So anyway, so that's the short answer. And uh, anyway, and then long, just to complete, uh, after the United States Navy, I still didn't know what the hell I wanted to do, uh, but I was in graduate school at Michigan uh, in library science, and I took a course by uh, Leonard, Professor Leonard Eaton on Chicago architecture and literature, and wham, this happened, and there it is. <laughs> yes? Well, that was probably a, at least a 10-year project right there, or something like that, uh, on that one. Uh, and uh, on the Rhode Island State Capitol, it actually was a competition that they entered, uh, and it's the only state capitol they did. Uh, so they entered there, and once again, uh, they had lots of Rhode Island connections and so forth, and I don't know the whole story and never been able to find it, but anyway, they got the job there. And that was about a seven-year project or something like that. I mean, doing all that stone is a big deal. Yes? I'm afraid that some of these archives are at the Museum of the City of New York. Do you happen to know if that's true? Yes, there are some archives that are, they used to be at the New York Historical Society, uh, but now there's a museum there. But there's also archives that are up at, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, his letter books and so forth are actually down at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of McKinley and White stuff that's up at the Avery Library at Columbia University. So it's spread all over the place. Yeah. Enough, right? <laughs> so much, Dr. Wilson. That was terrific. We enjoyed that. Um, thank you all for being here this afternoon. And those of, of you who joined us online, thank you for joining us. And we will look forward to seeing you next week for a lecture on uh, Daniel Burnham by Kristen Schaefer. In the meantime, we have books at the back that I'm sure that Dr. Wilson will be happy to sign for you, as well as books from previous lectures that are signed at that you may want to pick up as well. So thank you again for being here. Thank you to our sponsors related 
First Republic Bank and Smith Architectural Group for making this series possible. We'll see you next week.